All right. Not everyone came back for the love sermon tonight. I don't get it. We, you know, maybe maybe they, I offended them too much with this morning sermon. I don't know. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I don't think I offended anybody, but you never know. Or maybe they're thinking, oh, yeah, love sermons is going to be boring. It's not going to be boring. Don't worry. But we're starting off here. In, we're actually going to be looking through 1 John 3, 4, and 5. It, it's all very much related. There's a lot about, you know, love and loving in the book of 1 John. And there's actually, there's multiple things that I want to kind of cover tonight. But the title of my sermon is Love the Brethren. There's different aspects of loving different people. I mean, we're supposed to love the lost, you know, in, in different ways uh, of loving people. But this, this evening sermon is going to be focused on loving the brethren, loving those people who are saved, other believers in Christ, and how we ought to be loving towards them. And don't get me wrong. I mean, there's, this is all multifaceted. The Bible is multifaceted. There's not just any one thing that you just do all the time, right? I mean, you're not just always the, the, this hard person that's just like, you know, has, is so rigid that there's no mercy, no compassion, everything else. Now, that's not to say that we're compromisers of God's word, right? But there's, there's different aspects uh, uh, that we need to incorporate into our Christian life. And we need to look at how Christ was. Christ was sinless, yet he had a lot of mercy and compassion, right? There's a lot of love there. He was able to be, to be very forgiving of people and, and not um, just holding everybody to every last little thing and, you know, things like that. So, we, you know, this is just one of the things we want to take away from this. We're going to get into the scripture. I'm going to do my points based off of what we cover as we go through them. Let's start here in verse number 14 of 1 John chapter 3. Because 1 John, actually, the book of 1 John has a lot of things that, are, that can be very confusing to people. I don't think it's a confusing book. I actually think it's relatively easy. But there's a few phrases, a few verses in here that a lot of people in the false doctrine will end up using just completely falsely. And, you know, I know personally that some things were a little bit more difficult earlier on in my Christian growth, in my Christian life, to be able to understand this. But... Um, we're not going to hit all those tonight, but even when it comes to just like loving the brethren and stuff, there's a lot here on that, but we need to take the Bible as a whole. Like I said, there's, there's, there's different facets on, on how we do that. And, you know, this is, this is the passage, the, the famous passage, you know, God is love. Well, we don't just take one little phrase and just run with that. And say, well, God is love, so love is love. And we're going to have, you know, these sodomites can all love each other. And it's going to be a big love fest. And no one could ever say anything negative or bad about anyone or, or say that this is wrong or judge because God is love and loving is love. You know, that's nonsense, obviously. So we're going we're gonna to look and see what the Bible says here. And, and hopefully we could walk away with a, with a, with a right spirit and, and have a right a, a view and, and a proper love towards people especially those that are saved, other, you know, other brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, let's start reading our verse number four, 14 of 1 John chapter 3. The Bible says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Now, right off the bat, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on online, and, and I'm really not gotten into it. I don't know what's going on with some people talking about the gospel and people, you know, I don't know that much about it. I, there's a reason why I've been less and less and less on social media because I don't like being involved in drama in general. And it's not because I'm afraid to make a stand. It's not because I'm, you know, but, but sometimes I think that there's just, so, there's just so much drama that goes on and I really don't care to be a part of it at all. I, I have no reason to, you know, and I'm not, this is not me condemning anybody. I just choose to not really be a part of it. And, and I don't know that much about it, but there's, there's certain things that, that we just, we need to be careful that, that we don't get so focused on, on, on one thing. And I'm not, and I'm trying to be careful in choosing my words because obviously like salvation is very important and we don't want to have the wrong impression, and we don't want to, to put off a wrong thought or a wrong vibe. But at the same time, we have to be true to Scripture and what the Bible actually says. And one of the things I, I've seen, and, I, and, and nothing was really directly correlated, so I don't, I don't really want to focus on what was said by anybody in particular, but one of the dangers we could have is, obviously, first of all, we don't believe in any type of lordship salvation, right? Making Jesus the Lord of your life or anything associated like that. And we ought to be very, very clear about that. Salvation is by grace through faith. But one of the things 
that, um, that the Bible teaches here. You know, and we also don't uh, judge people whether or not they're saved just based on their works, right? So if someone's drunk, we don't say, oh, well, that person's not saved because they're drinking. Okay, we don't do that. Because, why? Because that kind of leads to this mentality of a lordship salvation, of saying, well, if you were saved, you would be doing all of this stuff. And yeah, we ought to be very, very clear about that too. But in our zeal and desire to make ourselves extremely clear and well-known, I'm like, yes, it's not of works at all. Your works do not just dictate whether or not a person is saved. There are parts of the Bible that talk about us having assurance of our salvation and things that go, that go along with being saved. For, for example, a little, a little bit off topic, but like, you know, a, a person who's saved, there's certain things they'll never do, right? Like they won't ever take the mark of the beast. A believer will never do that. So that could be an indication, that will be an indication, if someone ends up taking the mark of the beast, that person was never saved. And you know what? That's an hour. To, you, you would be completely justified in saying that because that's what the scripture says, right? And as not, you know, it's not because, the, you know, they're involved in some sin. They took the mark of the beast. There's no way they were saved. They were never saved. And they never will be saved because they're going to hell. Because they took the mark of the beast and worshiped, you worship his image. So um, on the same token, there's certain things that the Bible talks about. And here in 1 John, we're going to see the first one. The Bible says, we know that we have passed from death unto life. What's that talking about? Being saved. I mean, my favorite verse in the whole Bible, John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It's a salvation verse. It talks about our soul being saved. We, we've passed from death unto life. And now the same man, John, is recording here. He's saying, we know we know that we've passed from death to life. One of the ways that we can know that, one of the ways that you can know that individually, this is what Scripture says, is because we love the brethren. He's going to explain more about this, about how we ought to love the brethren. And it's something that, that should happen in every believer's life. Now, again, People want to take that and run with that and turn that into all these works and everything else. No. And this isn't saying, this is how you know that someone else is saved. This isn't saying, this is how you can tell if someone else is saved or not. This is, this is how we know that we have passed from death and life. This is how I could know that I have passed. You, know, you want some assurance of your salvation because let's face it, many times people end up getting to a point in their life where they may end up doubting their salvation. It happens. It happened to me. I doubted my salvation years ago. I was saved. After I was saved, there was a point in my life where I had ended up just doubting. Am I, am I saved? I don't know. But one of the ways that we can be, have, have some level of assurance of our own salvation is because we love the brethren. Are, are you love? And, and again, we'll get into a little bit more about what does that word even mean? What does it mean to love the brethren? Does it mean, you know, like, is this some warm, gushy feeling? You know, all that. We'll, we'll get into that. But one of the ways that we just know, hey, I know I passed from death and life because we love the brethren. Now, is that not what the Bible just clearly says? This should not be a point of contention. And I don't even know if it is. That's why I'm saying, like, I don't want to get too involved in any other drama. But I don't want to not preach on a verse like this because someone might start using it to say, oh, Pastor Bersons believes in lordship salvation because he's saying this is how you can know that someone's saved because they're loving, you know, it's like, okay, look, this is what the Bible says, so I'm going to believe it and teach it and preach it. And it is what it is. So a saved person, you know what? One of the ways that you know that you're saved, one of the ways that you know that you've passed from death in life is, is your love for the brethren. There's a love that you will have that God gives you when you have that new spirit and you have brothers and sisters in Christ that you, you will have for you. I mean, I have a love for my brothers physically in this earth. And that's a, that's a love that's there by virtue of them being my brothers. And there's a spiritual connection that we have with other brothers and sisters in Christ. But again, this is something that we're going to have to judge inwardly, that we're going to have to look into ourselves to get the assurance. This doesn't mean that you're automatically going to be having so much love that you're doing all these different things for people and helping, you know, I'm, again, I'm not saying that and don't interpret it that way either. Let's just start with the Bible, with the words and, and see what they say and believe it. Let's keep going here. 
It says, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And again, that's a pretty strong statement. Now, one of the things I want to point out here, because this is really interesting, I see this all the time. And if you're a seasoned soul winner, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. We go out soul winning, we knock on someone's door. And they claim that they're saved, but they're really rude. They don't have anything to do with you. And they're really just irritated and agitated that they're there. What's the likelihood that that person is actually saved? I would say almost zero. Almost zero. And, and this, this, this truth here that we're covering plays into that. Because there are people, when you run into someone who is saved at the door, they love you. I mean, it's, it's, you, you never have this, and I would say never. Like, I don't know if I've ever had anyone ever once had the, te the, the salvation testimony of salvation by grace, through faith, no works, eternal security, you're sa yo, they're saved, ever been, had this, 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 you know, spirit of just like, nothing to do with you, get off my property, get out of here. Why? Because there's a spirit there and there's the spiritual connection and this is a truth that exists in God's word. I've had, the closest thing I've had to that one time is someone didn't come to the door because he thought we were Jehovah's Witnesses and when he saw that we were Baptists, he actually got in his car and brought us a bottle of water because he's like, oh, I didn't know you guys were Baptists. Because like we knew he was home and like he didn't, you know. And, and seriously, like that's, that, you know, there's, and, and I've had people where they were in a hurry and couldn't really talk, but that's different than, you know what I'm talking about, than the people who are just really agitated and really, you know. There's truth to that. Because there is a spiritual connection between the brethren. And what he's saying here, hey, we know that we pass from death and life because we love the brethren. And he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Verse number 15, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. Now, again, the wording here is very, very important and we need to be very careful on every single word so we don't walk away with false doctrine because the love he's describing now here in verse number 16 is the love that God had for us, which is such a selfless love of Jesus Christ offering himself up for, for wicked sinners, for people who have transgressed against him, people who have done him wrong, that don't deserve the mercy, that don't deserve anything, that don't deserve the love, that he decided to love them anyways, and so much to just give up his entire life for, for other people. I mean, think about, like, your life is the most precious thing that you have, your, your own life, right? Like, because once you're dead, you're dead. You know I mean? Like, obviously, we believe in afterlife. We believe in heaven and hell and stuff like that. But it's like, th 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 that's who you are, your life. And to lay that down of just, just say, I'm going to be done. I'm going to be done with my life for somebody else. You can't give anything more than that. That is the most that you can possibly do for anybody. So that's a great love, right? Greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friend. That's what the Bible says. There is no greater love than that. And that's the love that God has for us. Now, notice it doesn't say that you will automatically have that love and if you're not willing to give your life for your brethren, then you're not even saved. That's not what it says. Because that's why he says we ought to. We ought to. That, that is what we should have. It doesn't mean you have that. But we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. We ought to love each other that much. So obviously there's a difference here between having that level of love for people and just the, the level of love where that says, hey, I know I love my, you know, I know I'm past from death and life because I love my brethren. We ought to be able to lay down our lives. And we ought to remember that too. And, and uh, you know, again, I'm kind of going a few different directions tonight, but try to stay with me. The love that we have for each other ought to be such a love that's so selfless that we are willing to give of ourselves and give of our own lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. That is a, that is a Christ-like love. And we need to be viewing others in the church the same way. And I mean, Christ is such the perfect example of how we ought to love because like I mentioned before, we transgress against him. 
people may transgress against you. You may not like people or whatever. You have your differences. And I'm not saying that in church, especially in a bigger church, you know, you don't have to be friends with everybody, like the best buds with every single person in the church. Right? It's not going to happen. People have some different personalities, and some people you click with a little better than others, personally, and things like that. But you ought to love every believer in that church because they're brethren. And we ought to remember, we ought to have the love that says, I'm willing to give my life for that person. That is a very strong love to have. That's a, you know, obviously, that's a, that's a big deal. And this is what we're saying. We ought to have that. We ought to have that love. And we need to remind ourselves of this when there are problems, because God wants the church in one accord, in unison, together, being able to work together, regardless of differences, regardless of personalities, regardless of this, you ought to still have that love when it comes down to it. Hey, you know what? I love that person. They're a brother in Christ. And I'm going to try to help to edify them and lift them up and whatever. Now, obviously, there's other rules involved. We have 1 Corinthians chapter 5, who you're not supposed to associate with. But again, that's still a form of love. You're, you're, you're loving them because you're trying to help them to get over whatever some major sin they have in their life. But short of those things, you know, again, like I said, you don't have to just you know, spend all your time with people, right? But having that love and, and, and just kind of remembering that that's the love we ought to have can go a long way in just how we're dealing with people and keeping divisions and factions and separations within a church down to a minimum. If everyone has this, this same type of a spirit and a love for other people, it's going to be less likely to have the splits and because as churches get bigger and we have people visiting from, you know, from, from the church that is a lot bigger than our church is, but we need to keep this in mind just as much as everybody else. This is, this is important for everybody, regardless of how big the church is. I don't want to have a, a faction group in here. Even with just small, you know, small number of people, we're just having some factions like, and, and, I don't think they should really exist. Like I said, you can have different groups of friends where you spend more time with because you have similar interests or whatever. Great. But that, that should not be to the point of just, well, I, you know, hate this person, right? You know, like we should never hate the brethren. You should love your brethren. So um, let's keep going here. Verse number 17, the Bible says, But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwell the love of God in him? Now, this is another form, you know, another way to show your love is by helping people out when they're in need, right? It's not, you know, there's the one, he starts off with the greatest love of laying down your lives for the brethren, but he says, you know, hey, if you've got this world's good, if God's blessed you financially, you, you have things, you know, you're doing all right, and your brother has a need, you've got a brother in Christ, they're struggling, they're, you know, and then you just shut up your, you know, it says your bowels of compassion, you're not compassionate towards a struggling brother in Christ and just, nope, deal with it. The Bible says, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And again, we have to, the best way to have the proper love is to kind of flip things back around on ourselves and think about how much God has helped you in your life when you didn't deserve it. Because it's easy to get cold towards other people and it's even easier when you're doing better and you're doing well and things are going well for you. And maybe you've gone through some hard time. And you say, well, suck it up, buttercup. You know, you do your own, get your own way there, right? And obviously there's, there's a little, there's, you know, if, again, if someone's just involved in all kinds of sin and that, that's why they're having these problems, we don't just solve problems by giving money to people. But that's, you know, if they're a drunkard or something, they shouldn't be in the fellowship anyways. This is talking about our brothers. You know, someone who's called a brother and someone, you know, someone who's not applicable to other areas of the Bible that would tell you to, to maybe do something a little bit differently. This is talking about people who, they're legitimate, they have a problem, they're going through a hard time. We shouldn't be shutting up our bowels of compassion from them and saying, well, how, how does the love of God dwell in you when you're not willing to love your brother or sister in Christ to help them out when you have something that you can help them with? Verse number 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And that's what it all boils down to. And, and this is a really good definition of love because love isn't just some feeling. Love isn't just some words. Say, oh, I love my brother. I love my sister. You, know, you show your love in deed and in truth. That's how, that, that is what 
is going to be a good definition of love is just, it's not because you say something. It's because you do something. That's what's in deed. Deed are the things that you do. I'm going to help this person. And I'm not just going to say I'm going to help them. I'm not actually going to do it. You know, we covered this last week with James chapter 2. You know, what does the prophet? You know, if someone comes to you and say they, they don't have clothing and they don't have food and you just say something nice to them and say, oh yeah, be warm, be filled. But you don't actually give it to them. You didn't do anything. You don't actually love them because you didn't do anything for them. You just opened up your mouth and said some things that sound good. We need to have love in deed and in truth. And that truth part is also very important. Because when you love somebody, you're going to show it in what you do, but you're also going to show it in truth, which is sometimes the be, you know, sometimes there's a tough love. Or a love that that's, yeah, people need to hear things in truth. And, it's a, and, and there's a way with dealing people, because you know, the, the goal would be to help somebody out. Right? If you notice that you have a brother that's overtaken in a fault, the Bible says that we're supposed to, in, in meekness, help to instruct those that oppose themselves and try to, and try to show people, hey, he's overtaken a fault. I'm going to try to help to bear his burden. I'm going to love that person and, and maybe help to show them the error. Right? And that's how we do it in truth. I'm going to get a little bit more on that point a little bit later on. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4, just one, one chapter over, verse number 7. The Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And again, there's, you know, as we go through this, we're going to see more statements and phrases like this that, yeah, when you're saved and you're born of God, there's a love that should be there because you're saved as just a, 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 if you call it an evidence or an assurance of your faith, like that is, that should be there. And, and what this is saying is that everyone that loveth is born of God. So if you love, then, then you are born of God. People who, um, anyways, let's keep going. And, and knoweth God. That's, let's not leave that out either. And everyone that loveth God is born of God and knoweth God. Verse number eight, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Again, there's that word ought. Right? It brings up the fact that God sent his only begotten son to pay for our sins, the, the selfless love of dying for us, and that's how we ought to love one another. And he, he follows that up with right before saying that, hey, everyone that loveth is born of God, and if you don't love, you don't know God, basically, you know, it's drawing this distinction. But I would say that there's a difference between being willing to give your life and the love that just comes with, with uh, being saved, right? With, um, with knowing God and being born of God. And he, what he wants us to do is to excel and to grow that love to the point to where we ought to love one another the way that God loved us. Verse number 12, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother... He is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So it's a commandment that we, that we need to follow. And you can't sit there and say that you love God when you don't love your brother in Christ. If you hate your brother, the Bible is very clear as saying like you don't love God. You can say you love God all you want. People say they love God all the time. But that doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it right. Just like people say they, they love their children, but they spare the rod. We saw that this morning. I was, we were talking about it after service. Is, you know, the Bible says if you spare your rod, you hate your son. So I'm going to go with what the Bible says over what, what you say you feel or think. In the same case here, you could tell me how much you love God, but if you hate your brother, you don't love God. Bottom line, turn if you would to chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 1. 
The Bible says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So it's saying, everyone that loves God, everyone, because that's who begat, right? God's the one who, who begat us, you know, again. And it says, everyone that loveth him that begat, which would be God, loveth him also that is begotten of him, loves everyone else that is born again, loves everyone else that is saved. If you truly love God, you will also love everyone else. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And see, this is why I think some people might even just stay away from preaching on verses like this because you can see how you can get into, oh, well, if you're saved, you're going to love. And if you love, then you're going to keep the commandments. And then that just, see, how that's how we show that because that's how I know you're saved because you're keeping his commandments. That's a false logical conclusion there. It's, it's, it doesn't work because like, you have to be very careful with the way that the words are written there. I believe it's possible for a person to be saved and not love God. It's possible. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. There's people out there that are saved, but they don't keep the commandments of God. They don't love God. Just like it's possible for people to be saved and their faith is dead. Why? Because they have no works and faith without works is dead. They're still saved because they received the free gift. But they don't love God and their faith is dead. Now, some people have our time to say, well, that doesn't make sense. How could you not love God if you're saved? Well, because all you did was receive a free gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. It's not hard. To I mean... The, the homeless person that can receive a free gift from people giving them money doesn't have to love every person that gives them money. Yeah. They just accept it. The Bible says in verse number three there, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Turn if you would to Romans chapter 13. We see in 1 John 3, 4, and 5, we see there's a differentiation between the different levels of love, okay? And ultimately, what I, what I, because I don't want you to be confused at all, so I'm, I'm trying to replay some of the things I've said to make sure that I'm not making things unclear when they're supposed to be very clear about what we can learn from those chapters. We get our assurance, our own assurance. We saw in 1 John chapter 3, one of the ways is, hey, if you're loving the brethren, then you're also loving God. Like you have to, the two, you can't separate the two. You can't love God and not love your brethren because then the Bible says you're a liar and you can't love your brother and not love God. That doesn't make any sense either. You, you, they both go together. And when you love your brothers, you know that, that that's how you, you, you know you've passed from death unto life because you have that love there. You love, you love other brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to have a love where we're willing to lay down our lives for other people. We ought to have a love where we're keeping God's commandments. We ought to have that love of God. But not everyone will. And see, that's how when we're looking at ourselves, we know if we love our brethren. We know, you know, and you can look at that and say, hey, well, maybe, and, and you know, maybe you're doubting yourself, Asia, and maybe you're doubting, well, I don't even do anything for anyone. I've never done, you know, like I don't, I don't seem to care about anyone. I'm shutting up my bowels of compassion. And, you know, like, then I would say, yeah, I mean, check your own salvation then. But the outward love, this outward expression that you're going to love in deed and in truth is not some surefire thing to say that someone's not saved. But if someone... Um, I don't know what I was going to say. Turn, turn forward to Romans 13. Hopefully, hopefully that's, that's kind of you know, cleared up because that's what I just want to make sure that, that we walk away from that, that chapter understanding. That it does help us with our, our own assurance. And that is how saved people ought to live. Romans chapter 13, we're going to look at verse number 8. 
Bible reads, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And again, we get a good definition of love here. And you see how love is, is tied in with keeping the commandments, with, with the law, because God's laws prevent us from violating or doing ill to other people, doing things that would be hateful to another person. His laws prevent us from doing that. So by loving, and this is, a, this is a, great, you know, a great way to understand or have a definition for love because it could be so abstract and people could be so confused. What are you even talking about when you say love? Well, we love people when we don't do harm to them. We love people when we're not murdering them or raping them or uh, stealing from them or lying to them. The Bible says that the, that the, um, the lying tongue hateth. Um, the, the person who's affected by it, I know that's not a, that's not a direct quote, but that you hate the person, like whoever you're lying to or about, it's because you hate them. You, you cannot love a person when you lie to their face or when you're lying about them. That's what the Bible says. And that's just one, that's just one scenario, that's one aspect. But the Bible says here that the love doesn't work any ill to so you're not going to do anything bad to someone that you love. And therefore, because that reason, because love does not violate other people, you're not doing anything wrong to them, it fulfills the law. Because ultimately, you boil down God's law. It's basically, you know, to, to love your neighbor yourself and love God. I mean, that's, those, are, those are the two basic commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, spirit, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you're not going to hurt, as much as you don't want to hurt yourself, you don't hurt someone else, you're going to keep the law. And you're going to do all right. But again, that's works. And when you love someone, you're, you're doing it, you're expressing it by your works. You're, you're showing your love by your works, you're by, by keeping the commandments, by not transgressing against somebody. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And I think people that have a hard time with their own salvation it's because they don't have the works so they don't feel and I know I know for a fact that was the case with me my own doubting of my salvation came at a point in my life where I yes I was saved but I wasn't going to church I wasn't reading my Bible I wasn't doing anything that I knew the Bible says that I should be doing as a believer I wasn't had any of those works so guess what my faith was dead and I couldn't even say that I loved God because then I would be a liar because I wasn't loving my brethren because I, was, you know, I wasn't doing any of those things. Again, it doesn't make me unsaved. Of course I was saved. But the lack of the works, a dead faith is going to cause people to doubt. And it got to the point to where I was questioning my own assurance of my salvation. But if I would have, which I ultimately ended up doing, obviously, you know, start doing works, getting involved, that assurance comes back. Oh, I'm loving the brethren now. Now it's easier for me to say I love God because I'm loving other people. I'm loving my brother and I'm, and I'm starting to keep, the, you know, keeping the commandments. And then that gives you more assurance of your own salvation. And at any point, someone could have looked at me in my life and this is why I want to be very clear about this. I'm trying to be careful with the words I say and choose them carefully. But be very clear that in no way is, is that referring to a lordship salvation of works. Because you could have looked at me when I was still saved, when I was saved, and been like, that guy's not a Christian. He's going out to the bar, he's fornicating, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's, you know, doesn't go to church, doesn't read his Bible, doesn't, you know, like, I was still saved. Because none of that stuff was a requirement. And I wasn't, even though I did have a new creature and a new spirit that was born inside of me, I was allowing my flesh to rule my life. The spirit was still there. 
And as 1 John 3 says, you know, that, that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The Spirit never sinned one time while I was off in that sin because the Spirit is the, 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 was born of incorruptible seed and cannot sin. But I was sinning. My flesh was sinning. But when I tried to die to self and get my spirit stronger by walking in the spirit more, then uh, the assurance of my salvation comes back and love for the brethren grows and the love for God grows. Romans chapter 15, let's look at verse number one. The Bible says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So this is an attitude that we ought to have in order to love the brethren of when you are strong, you're strong in your faith, you're strong in, you know, you're strong in your spiritual walk, hey, help bear the infirmities of the weak because not everyone is strong. I mean, I, I wish, would to God, if I was just going to church, I had someone to help me through those times where I was spiritually just really weak and had no assurance because that would have made that time a lot easier and it probably would have brought me back the direction I needed to be going a lot sooner than I actually did because it took me a long time to get right with God. A very long time. And it's only going to happen, though, through people who have a, a mindset of not pleasing ourselves. And again, I'll just challenge you. What do, are you thinking about on a regular basis? Are you always just concerned about pleasing yourself? If you are, then that's a problem. It's a problem. That's not the love that we have. You know, if you're just concerned about... I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to have fun doing this and I want to have fun doing this and I'm just worried about myself and just day in, day out, that's what you're thinking about? Then there's a love problem there. Because we're supposed to be, we're commanded here, we ought to have the love for other people to be concerned about helping them out and doing things to help others and to support the weak and bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Verse number two, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Now, we're going to cover edification quite a bit. We got a few more references to that word, but that word is very important because edification is, is um, a word that just means to build somebody up. Our job as, as brethren is not to tear down our brothers or sisters in Christ and talk bad about them and do whatever to, to not to help them. It's the exact opposite. We need to not be focused on ourselves, focus on others, please his neighbor for his good to edification to build them up. The, the attitude that John the Baptist had towards Jesus Christ, that I, he must increase, but I must decrease. It's more about him. I don't care about my own glory. I don't care about what's going to please me. I'm going to do this work for him. I'm going to point people to him and let him increase, and I'm willing to just go down. Just, I'll decrease. I don't need any attention. Put it all on Christ. Verse number three, for even Christ pleased not himself. And again, we have Christ being the example for us. Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And think about the life of Christ. Do we ever read about Jesus saying, you know what, I'm just going to uh, go hang out at my boathouse and get away from everything and, and now I'm focused on I'm going to do this and now I'm going to buy that and now I'm going to get my new car and I'm going to, you know. Jesus wasn't in all that. He wasn't in any of that. He dedicated his life to serve other people. I mean, that's what he did with his entire life. Now, I know that you're not going to be Jesus Christ and that we're sinners. But as I mentioned this morning, that's not an excuse. We shouldn't just be making up excuses. Well, I'm a sinner, so whatever. No, let's strive to have the love that Christ had. Let's strive to be the servant that Christ was. And to care, and, and to genuinely care more about other people. It's not in my notes, but in Philippians, I think it's chapter 3, the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ. Let, you know, let each man esteem, esteem others better than himself. Amen. That when, you, when, when you're putting someone else above your own needs and your own self, that is the love that we ought to have, and especially the brethren, loving the brethren. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 4 of Romans 15, the Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, 
that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. We ought not to get into these, this place where we're not receiving brethren. Where you're, because not receiving would be what? Rejecting them. Right. Turning them away. I'm not, you know, this is my brother in Christ, but I'm just going to reject them because I don't like this about them and I don't like that about them. Well, why don't you think about some of the things that maybe Christ didn't like about you when he received you? And that's the attitude we need to remember to have. We're, we're, you know, hopefully no one in here is thinking so highly of themselves that they're just perfect and they don't do anything wrong and have no faults. Because Christ accepted you with all of your faults. Now he wants you to change those things, of course. But he still received you. And God will receive you when you breathe your last breath because you're born again. And because God will receive you, we ought to be able to receive our brethren. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to see a few verses in 1 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Start reading in verse number 17. The Bible says, And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're going to jump down to verse number 22. I just wanted to get this context here because we're, we're spending our time here. Um, we know that we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, right? That, that his blood is very precious in redeeming us and is perfect. Verse number 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, which is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So seeing that you were saved by the precious blood of Christ, in obeying the truth unto, so unto means like for the purpose of, in, you know, unto unfeigned love of the brother so that you can love the brethren and it's not a fake love. It's real. It's unfeigned. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And, you know, fervently. I mean, that's seriously. That's not just, yeah, I love him. I mean, you really mean it. I mean, it's a pure heart and you love your brother in Christ. Uh, turn over to chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. I mean, this concept is very important. Think about how strong a family will be if the family doesn't love each other. Like if there's no love, if, if people aren't doing things for each other and helping each other out, you know, just in a family, a family, you know, mom, dad, kids, you know, brothers, sisters, and no one is there to, to help them out in their time of need. Is that going to be a strong family? No, everyone's going to go their own ways and the family's going to go, Pfft. right? It's not going to be very strong. But the family that's there, you know, you know, I know my dad loves me. I know my mom loves me. I know my brother loves me. I know my sister loves me because anytime I have a problem, I can go to them and they are there and they're going to help me out. That's the, the type of love that we ought to have for our brethren our spiritual brethren. You're there for them. You're going to receive them. You're, you're there to help them. You know, this, this, it's not just, even though, you know, physically you're strangers, right? You're born of different families or whatever. We ought to be sharing the closeness of being brothers and sisters in the family of Christ. This is the concept that the Bible is trying to get across. 
And this is what's going to make a great, strong church. A church that is in one accord. Because everyone's going to be striving, not against each other, but together. Striving together for the cause of Christ in unity because you're able to overlook other people's faults. You're able to join with them and just say, I'm going to esteem them better than me. I'm going to love my brother. I'm going to receive them. And you know what? We all have this common goal. And people are going to be at all various levels of their own spiritual life. Some people are going to be babes in Christ and are going to be very carnal. And you're going to have to show long-suffering. You're going to have to exhibit some mercy. But if they're a brother, you receive them. Other people have been around a lot longer, you know, and they've got things down, and maybe they're walking a great walk. But, you know, you just don't like them for some reason. Hey, they're your brother. Receive them. Let's all work together. Let's strive together for the same cause and the common goal. And let's make sure that we have a family that, you know what, even if I don't like this person very much, if they're in need, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to help them out. I'm not going to shut up my bowels of compassion towards them. And maybe a need never comes up, but if you already have that decided in your heart that I'm going to be like that, that's already going to strengthen the church. It's going to strengthen the body. It's going to strengthen the family. I'm, my, my physical family may never have a need that I would need to step in and do something. But just knowing in my own heart that, hey, if any of them ever had a problem, they need look. They could, all, they could come live with me. You know, I'll support them. I'll try to help them. I'll do whatever I can for them. Why? Because I want to be the best, you know, have the love for them that we have a strong family. Even if they never need it, just knowing that strengthens the relationship. It's going to strengthen that bond. And, and we need to make sure that if there's, if there's an area of our heart and there's people who are just like, yeah, you know what? I don't, I don't love them. We need to change that. We need to, we need to get right. Um, Did I read from 1 Peter chapter 3 yet? Yes? I don't know if we did. Look at verse number 8. Let's look at verse number 8 here, 1 Peter chapter 3. The Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil. So, if you're in the body of Christ, is he saying that there's never going to be any evil done to you? No. But what he says is how to handle that, right? If you're pitiful, if you're courteous, if someone does evil to you, don't go and respond with evil. Don't render evil for evil or railing for railing. Someone rails against you and they're a brother. Don't, don't respond in like manner, but contrarywise blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And his lips that they speak no guile, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. We don't want to have fights and strivings and divisions. We want to seek peace. We want to be, and, and you know what? Sometimes the only way to have peace is for you to humble yourself and just say, okay, I'm just going to leave that there. We already have a spiritual battle that we got to fight. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're fighting against all the false religions of the world. There's a lot of fighting that we have going on. We don't need fighting happening inside the house of God among brethren. We need to be strong together and lifting one another up and, and being concerned about helping each other because your brothers and sisters in Christ, they're facing their own battles out there and they need to be edified. And if you can't come to a place and receive that edification in church, you're not going to get it out in the world. We need to have that. Here's why we need to have that unity and that love for the brethren. Ephesians chapter 4. This is the last place I'll ever turn tonight. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to wrap things up here. There's actually quite a few, ver there's, there's at least three, I think there's, I don't know if there's any more than that, there's at least three verses that, that refer to um, edifying and building people up in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at those right now because that is our goal. That's what we want to do in the church. We want to help other people succeed, become stronger, 
and become stronger spiritually. To become better Christians. That's what, that's as a church member, you ought to have that mind and that goal to help other people out. And that's why, you know, we were talking earlier today and I thought it was a great story of, of someone that um, was trying to help another brother out by saying, yeah, I'll go and do this and this with you, but hey, come on out sewing with us because that's going to help that person out. That's, that's being spiritually minded, loving that person, loving an area that maybe they need to grow in, but considering them enough and considering the cause enough and, and being able to be unified and say, okay, hey, yeah, we'll go do this, we'll have some fun, but let's, let's, let's focus on this, let's do this. And then we could do the other. And, that, and that's good, that's a sign of unity, that's, that's a sign of, of, of having compassion and caring about people and not, and not looking down your nose at someone for not doing something they ought to be doing. Because we don't ever want to have that type of an attitude of looking down at people. This person does this and that person does that. And, you know, I'm better than all these people because they have these problems, this problem, this problem. That is, that is not going to do the church any good at all. Amen. You need to be able to overlook that stuff and realize I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. I'm going to receive this person as long as they're not, like I mentioned before, they're not doing a 1 Corinthians chapter 5 sin that just you can't even have lunch with them. Right. Then I'm going to receive them. I'm going to be the bigger person. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to care about that person. And if they do me wrong, I'm going to care about them even more. And I'm going to bless them. And, and God will deal with anything that needs to be righted that's wrong. But I'm not going to let this cause divisions and fightings and stuff among my brother or my sister. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So these different positions that were given, God wants the body of Christ. He wants the church edified. He wants this church built up. And there's people that are in place specifically to try to help with that, to try to teach and exhort people and say, hey, man, let's work together. Let's edify things. Verse number 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith, because that's what God wants. He doesn't want there to have all these divisions. Of, he wants everyone in the unity of faith regarding, his, regarding the truth of the Bible. Now, are there going to be divisions? Yeah, at some level there always is, but that's just because people believe different. It's not because there's different truths. There's one truth. It's one word. There's, there's one thing that's right. And God would, wants nothing else, or, you know, nothing less than all of us to... to all have that same truth. Hey, we could all be in agreement in, in the truth in God's word. Wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be great. Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And again, he's talking about the body coming together and being nicely, fitly joined together. Everyone's working in accord one with another. And you know, learning, growing, not being, you know, deceived by all the deceivers out there trying to spread false doctrine, speaking the truth in love, growing up in him, growing together, a church, growing up together and um, fitly joined together and making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself. So edifying one another, all the different members of the body edifying itself in love. Now, most of what I've covered tonight is you know, in some ways has been somewhat generic. But I think here's where people have a problem with loving the brethren in deed and in truth. And, I, and I've alluded to it earlier. I didn't really go too far in depth with it because I knew I was going to cover it a little bit later. But it's when there is a fault with someone. Because this is the most difficult time. It's when, you know, when everything's going great, everything's going great, there's no problems, right? No one does you wrong. Hey, I don't have any problems loving my brethren when... There's no reason not to, right? And there's no problem not to receive people. Everything's fine and dandy, but that's not why these verses are all in the Bible. It's not for when everything's great. You, 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 you make the vow to your wife, you know, for richer, for poorer. 
you know, in sickness and in health, you know, they're, they're, you say those things because it's like, hey, even in the bad times, I'm still going to stay with you. In the good times, you don't even, you know, the vows don't even are necessary because of course you're going to stay together dur with, during the good times, right? But it's the vow is there for during the bad times. And what we're receiving here about loving the brethren, you know, we need to remember this stuff during the times when someone's doing you wrong because that's when it's really going to be tested or tried. Do you really love your brethren? When nobody's in need, no one has a problem saying, oh yeah, I'm not going to shut up my bowels of compassion from them until someone's in need and comes to you. That's when it becomes a different story. That's when your faith is tried. That's when, when your love is tried. Now there's someone there in need. Now, now there's something forcing this to the front, to the issue. Is this actually going to happen? And the problem comes in is when, you have a, when, when someone is at fault, when there's a problem with someone else in church, and there's a few choices that are acceptable on how to deal with this within the church. One is to overlook their faults and to show grace. We've seen that in the scripture. That's something that we ought to do. Hey, don't let things become a problem. Just let it roll off your back. The other thing you can do is confront them about it humbly, especially if you think they're in error, they're at fault. Bring it to their attention, right? And you could go through the whole, the, you know, what the scripture lays out about if someone does you wrong, you know, you go to them and try to just deal with it. And then if that doesn't work, you get someone else involved to try to help, you know, mediate the problem with you and that every word could be established. They could listen to the whole thing. And, you know, if that doesn't work, you got to bring it in front of the church. You know, there's the whole, the whole line of, of how you deal with things. And that is acceptable. That's something that as problems occur, if it's something that you just can't overlook, you just can't let it go because there's, you just have to, it has to be done, right? Okay, there's a mechanism for dealing with that. But you deal with it through the process that is laid out in the Bible and those are examples, those are the, the options that you have to deal with something. But what is not acceptable is to start going down one of those paths, like say the first one, where you say, okay, well, I'm just not going to make a big deal with it. I'm going to overlook it. But then you just have bitterness in your soul against that person. But then you're just going to hold that over their head and you're not going to love them and you're going to hate them because they did me wrong and I just can't forget about this thing. I can't just let it go. When you already said, I'm just going to, you know, you've already decided, hey, I'll just let this go. No big deal. Okay, whatever. Because you didn't really let it go then. And that's when it becomes a problem. And that's when you're thinking like, oh man, this person did this to me and I'm never going to forgive them. And you know, even though I might say I forgive them, I never actually did because I'm still talking about it. I'm still holding on to it. I'm still just not going to love that person. That's not acceptable. That is not, that is not a proper way of dealing with your problems. Because if something's a problem, then you're going to have to deal with it with that person. And, and the church then is going to have to make a judgment. If you think it's that serious of an issue that you can't let it go, then deal with it that way. But then when the church makes a decision, guess what? You have to stick with that because that's the authority that God gave. And then at that point, if the decision goes against you, guess what? You can't have the bitterness. You still have to have the love. You still have to deal with whatever decision was made. And if it goes in your favor, you can't say, ha ha, I was right. And then still have bitterness towards that person and not, you know. We shouldn't have that type of an attitude that's going to hurt and destroy the church. We need to have the love of the brethren to not have the bitterness, to not complain, and not to gossip. The Bible says in Proverbs 18.8, the words of a talebearer as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. When people are, are in, have their own faults, you deal with that fault, huh? whichever way you want to deal with that, that's right. But you know what you don't do? You don't talk about that. You don't go around and tell other people so-and-so has this fault and so-and-so has that fault or whatever. They did me, you know, and because what are you doing when you do that? When you're talking about other people badly. Does that help the person that you're talking about when you're telling someone else something bad about someone that you know? Does that solve your problem? If you have a problem with that person, all it does is going to make someone else now be negatively influenced against another person. That's the only thing that could come of it. That's why the Bible says the words of a tailbearer has wounds. You're doing hurt to someone. You're doing evil to people when you're gossiping about them. 
That is not love. You can't say you love someone and then go and gossip about them behind their back. Or complain. Complaining is, 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 is very similar to gossiping when it comes down to things that happen within church. In Numbers 11.1, 1, we, we shouldn't ever forget this either, the way that God thinks about people who complain, about complainers. And that, you know, my kids, listen up to this, okay? Because nobody likes to hear complaining. I don't care who you are. I've not met one person that says, yeah, I like to hear people complain to me. Because <laughs> it gets old. And here, you know, here's what God thinks about complaining. Numbers 11, 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. God sent a fire and killed people because they were complaining. Right. And you know, you know what a complaining attitude comes from? Focusing on you. Because why are you complaining about? You're complaining about things that you don't like and that aren't working well for you because you're focused on you. If you're focused on other people and caring for other people, what do you have to complain about? You're trying to help them out. That's where, I mean, that's where depression comes from too. People get all depressed and they're sick of their life. Why? Because you're focused on yourself. When you're focused on other people and helping everyone else out, you don't have time to be, to be worried about how depressed you are about your own life. Because you're not worried about your own life because you're trying to help other people out and help them succeed. And when you do help other people succeed, you know what? You won't be depressed. Why? Because that feels good. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's, just, there's, there's something that God has given us as human beings that when we help other people out, it makes you feel good. We shouldn't be complaining. We shouldn't be gossiping. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, you should be there. Jump down to verse number 29. The Bible says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So when we decide to talk about things, keep this in mind. We don't want to have corrupt communication. We want to have communication that is good. Before you speak, say, is this going to be good for the use of edifying? Is this going to minister grace unto the person that's hearing this? If not, maybe you shouldn't say it. Look at verse number 31. The Bible says, let all bitterness and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all mal malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted. It means your heart's soft to people. You're not hardened against brothers and sisters in Christ. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And, and again, it boils down to that. You think about how much you've been forgiven of and that's the type of forgiving attitude that you ought to have towards other people. If Christ can forgive you for everything that you've done that was wrong, how can you not forgive a brother or a sister some wrong that they've done against you? That's going to help the attitude is going to help the love. Remembering that. Remembering Christ's love for you. And let's try to be Christ-like within the church. With, it, with our brethren. Let's have a strong... And you know what? If your family isn't here normally, or your family is down, your, your spiritual family is, is somewhere else, same truth. Same Bible. Let's have a strong family. Wherever your family is, wherever your body is that you're normally assembled with, make that strong. Whatever you can do. Don't, you don't want to be the part that's, that's causing all the problems, right? You want to help. We all here, I, I know we all here have the same goals. Everybody does. I'm confident of that. We want to see the most souls saved. We want to see 
as much as possible, a better future for our children. We want, we, we want to live a righteous life. We want to serve the Lord. In order to do so the most effectively within church, we have to get over ourselves and just make sure that we have a right heart and a, and, and, and a proper love towards people because holding on to things that, that you know, if someone's doing you wrong or anything like that, holding on to that stuff is, is not the answer. It's not going to help anything at all. Let's, uh, let's make sure that we, we are loving the brethren. And you know what? Let's strive to have the love that is selfless to the point of being willing to give of your life for your brother or sister in Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for um, these great truths that we can learn from your word. God, help them all to sink in. And, and God, help us all to look inwardly to ourselves. Lord, I, I know I need to do this. It's easy for us sometimes, I think, we get many areas covered in our lives spiritually as we start to grow. And sometimes we might get to a point to where we stop the introspection, where we stop looking at ourselves because we kind of think that we've We've, overpa we've, we've surpassed a lot of areas, Lord. I, I know that I'm not perfect in this area, Lord. Help me to be able to have the compassion on other people to, uh, to help out in their times of need and, and to love them the way that, that, that you would love them, Jesus, that, that Jesus would love them, and that, um, that I can follow in those types of steps and help us all to examine our own selves. And if there's, if there's anything that's, that's been... Um, that we've been struggling with, Lord, help us to, to overcome that and to, to just humbly, um, humbly pray for and bless those that even if they've done wrong to us, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.